Let's go now to our friend Bimnet Abibi from Galaxy Trading. As always, welcome to the show, Bim. Thanks for having me. So, um, obviously, the big stories of this week has been the regulatory uh, actions, the the civil suits brought by the SEC against Coinbase and Binance. So, let's just start right there. Um, any impact on markets? Uh, Bitcoin is currently trading at 26610 It was trading well, basically 27000 before yeah. the announcement came out. Um, you know, while I think there are very meaningful implications for, for the broader industry. Of course. Uh, for Bitcoin in particular, I, I don't think there was any implications. Yeah, down a tiny uh, bit, right? I mean, uh, I mean, da- down a tiny bit. But, you know, th- these cases ultimately don't really impact, you know, things that are commodities. Specifically that we know Bitcoin. Are specifically yeah. commodities. And so Bitcoin trades well. Anecdotally, most of the, you know, folks we talk to, um, you know, they were really impressed by the fact that Bitcoin held up so well, yeah, and like the macro types we talk through, there, there's generally like a sort of an apathetic sort of kind of view um, about it. Most folks have a bag; they've properly sized it in their portfolio, given you know the the volatility, um, you know, and then nobody's scrambling to add more, but nobody's like trying to sell either. Yeah, and so that's why you know Bitcoin is just kind of hovered w- where where it's been hovering, you know, for for the past like. Yep. several months um and so you know i think it's quite healthy to see you know a, a very resilient asset like this it's still up you know more than 50 percent on the year uh still one of the best performing asset classes it's liquid um it's legal uh, <laughs> yeah and so you know there's a lot of you know po- positive cross currents for, for for bitcoin in addition you know you've definitely seen some uh, selling of of alts, uh, particularly those named in 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 the suits. Um, and generally speaking, when you have a, a risk off move in crypto, um, folks you know sell alts and rotate into in, into Bitcoin. When folks are worried about uh, balances on exchange or um, et cetera, again, it's Bitcoin into cold storage. Yep. And so you know, Bitcoin definitely benefits from a uh, flight to quality phenomenon in crypto on on a relative basis. And so I think that partially explains, you know, some of the resilience behind it. In addition, um, it's really a market that trades at max pain right now. And so, you know, folks that short at bad levels, nine times out of 10 will get squeezed. And, uh, you know, I, you know, that might have to do with how the market makers operate and, or whatever. But um, it, do, it is a market that, that kind of does trade to, to max pain. In addition, you just kind of think about, you know, the, this asset, you know, over Memorial Day weekend, you basically went up to 28,500 from like, you know, the similar levels to now. Yeah, for no real uh, reason. For no just, real reason. Just just, it was just like a short squeeze. Yeah. And so, you know, I think this is... Um, an asset class that's probably likely going to remain relatively range bound. Uh, basically, everything has been thrown at Bitcoin. You know, collapses of three arrows, FTX. Now you got you know, you the, know the, the regulatory ca- stuff, the, regulatory the, cases. Stuff, the yeah. cases. Uh, you know, five hundred plus basis points of hiking. You know, domestically and all tight financial conditions everywhere around the globe, etc. And this thing is still holding up really well. And I think. You know, taking a step back, I think that bodes well for for the long run future of of this of, of this asset and the asset class in, in yep. general. The fact that it's holding up so well in the context of the world's most important government and regulatory agency kind of you know clamping down on things, and so um, I'm optimistic. In addition, you know, I do think that the macro will eventually um, start to be supportive of, of things like, you know, Bitcoin and precious metals and hedges against monetary debasement. Yeah. You know, to be honest, I thought the biggest news over the past month was the fact that we raised the debt ceiling it indefinitely, well, uh, to a specific time, but no cap in theory. Mm-hmm. Um, and we are going to spend money recklessly without abandon, you know, for the next <laughs> couple of years. And, you know, so is every other, you know, G10 economy. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, the the, mo- the monetary argument, like it becomes apparent every day. It's like it's like one of those things where it's like, wait, our debt goes up every day uh, and it's like we got to pay interest on it. And your ability to pay back that that reduces every single day, every day. Bitcoin's around more credible, more more participants, more adoption. And so it's one of those things that you just, you know, just need to give it time. And uh, yeah, I mean, I wish I could fast forward four years and 
you know, tell you where Bitcoin is going to be. But I feel pretty confident in saying that, you know, it'll be around. There'll mm -hmm. be tons of folks uh, transacting in it in novel ways, potentially, you know, ordinals, what, whatever it may be. Uh, but the monetary argument is only going to have gotten much, much stronger in four years time. Love I can that. tell you that for sure. Um, that was great. Uh, love the overview, Bim, and I, t I totally agree. L let me let me just shift gears. We'll do just no, one little question here, though it's not a little question, but before we wrap, because um, you know, sort of in our long line of periodic things that I've asked Bimnet Abibi about, mm -hmm. as I'm learning macro myself, one was that I saw Balaji Srinivasan, um, who's the former CTO at Coinbase, separately, and you know, a, an entrepreneur. Um, and he he's also the guy, right? He had the uh, what one one million dollar call price mm -hmm. call, which of course didn't happen for Bitcoin. Um, or really, he doesn't happened. know how to price options. Yeah, exactly. But he <laughs> he tweeted a chart that I believe that what the chart said was that it has been fourteen consecutive months in a row where non farm payrolls have um, come in have beaten expectations or not beaten one to of, have beaten have expectations. have beaten expectations, and that's like by far the longest streak ever. And essentially was suggesting that the BLS data is raw fake or manipulated yeah people have said that in the past i found a tweet from 2011 where jack welch the former ceo of general motors or ge whichever the owner of gm or whatever jack yeah. welch famous corporate guy he said the same thing about the bls data back then is that possible um i would say one um more and more serious folks that have looked at this data for you know decades uh, are highlighting that there there's some abnormalities yeah. for sure. There's some things that stick out, and 14 months of consecutive upward uh, beats is very surprising. Um, however, uh, it's not in the context of like what we know about the labor market. It is really hot, right? Um, so like the broad trend is like you no, wouldn't it's, disagree it's, with it's that. It's accurate, yeah. and so you know, one I'd like to stress that. Uh, non-farm payrolls is one piece of the data, right? There are tons of other data pieces to properly contextualize the, the U.S. labor market. You know, uh, the ADP uh, payroll data, right. that is, you know, a private uh, data series that produced by, you know, one of the largest payroll processing companies, right, still supports, you know, these massive job gains. Right. Like there's, you know, they're saying they're adding like hundreds of thousands of jobs as well. Um, and, you know, sort of like the employment components of, of PMIs and all of these surveys and, you know, uh, NFIB data, um, et cetera. Like, and you can see it in high frequency data, too, like like MTA travel and like, you know, right. like in, in Memorial Day, you had more planes in the sky than ever. Yeah. Right. And so there are ways to properly contextualize the data. With that being said, this data smells funky. For someone, sure, something wrong with and, that PLS data, and and one but it's of the, directionally one of, telling you the same thing all the other trustworthy data yeah, is saying. To your yeah, point. No, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, the other, the weird part about this though is like for the past two months you've had a we, uh, a very high adjustment in this thing known as like death birth uh, component, which is like uh, I, I believe estimates like how many like net new jobs were created as a function of like a business starting versus like a business going at out of business mm -hmm. and so like there are weird things like that in the data that have thrown it off um you know for the past couple of months and so yeah like i'm like looking at it with a grain of salt and i think a lot of serious people are looking at it with, with a grain of salt mm -hmm. um however it's just important to stress that it's not our only measure yeah and realistically it's not even a, a it's not the main priority for the central bank right now. Right. It, the central priority is inflation, getting inflation down. Yep. And on Tuesday, you've got core CPI that's expected to print at 0.4 month on month. You've had the Royal Bank, the RBA, uh, the Bank of Canada surprise hike over the past week, right? Because inflation's been too high and data's been, you know, too, too strong in, in general. And so you're dealing with a Fed that, has really no choice but to keep going until prices come down. Um, however, I do think that the committee is as split as they've ever been um, in, in this hiking cycle. There are more divergent opinions. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, I do think that there are, po there are pockets of weak data that are now starting to uh, sort of materialize. In addition, um, I think the supply outlook for, for treasuries is, is going to be a much more important factor. 
um, especially um, you know over the next three to four months as as you know the t- the treasury's general account builds mm. um, but high level like we're going to need to fund a lot of u.s debt and that money has to come from somewhere it's either rp or, or, or bank reserves yep and most likely going to a lot of it's going to come from from bank reserves a decent amount will come from rp uh, but that's going to be a liquidity drain on the market and there's going to be a ha- there's going to have to be a lot of treasury supply that gets absorbed by the market and you're going to take reserves down in, in the broader market to very like tight levels yeah um and eventually that's going to catch up to the fed and i think they're thinking about it now um as to you know when they might have to ultimately stop doing qt and not yep. necessarily do QE, but at least but at least stop the, stop the they, tightening, they stop stop the tightening, etc. Yeah. When you know they'll have a serious issue with banks and they'll have to you know try to re-steepen the yield curve, etc. And so the Fed's got visibility into that. However, the data, especially the price data, has just been so strong recently yeah. that it's just it's tough to even want to think are about go out that. And spend money over the summer too, right? People want to get outside and spend money, go to baseball games and whatnot, buy hot dogs, whatever Americans do, right? You know, I've, I like, hate hot dogs and I think baseball is boring, but uh, <laughs> you probably spend some money this things. summer. Yeah. yeah, I'm ready. I'm exactly. ready to hit the beach. Yeah, let's you go. Know. Hey, Bimnet Abibi from Galaxy Trading, my friend. As always, great to see you. Pleasure. <laughs>